Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tracy Glab, Curator of Collections and Exhibitions, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Sheppy Dog Fun Lecture at the Flint Institute of Arts with this virtual presentation by Dr. Lindsay Cook. The Sheppy Dog Fund was established in 2012 by Dr. Alan Klein to present speakers addressing the topics of art, religion, and history prior to the 19th century. Thank you, Dr. Klein, for continuing to bring these wonderful lectures to the FIA. I know everyone will enjoy hearing tonight's presentation by Dr. Lindsay Cook, and we look forward to you. We look forward to joining you again on July 14th for the Sheppy Dog Fun Lectures by Dr. Gary Rensberg on The Greatest Bible Ever Written on July 14th, and on August 25th for Dr. Joseph Reif's talk on the port of Caesarea Maritima. Please visit flintarts.org slash lectures for more information, as well as recorded presentations of previous Sheppy Dog Fun Lectures. A quick word about this virtual program before I introduce our speaker. Though we are airing this via Zoom, audience members are muted and your cameras are turned off. If you would like to submit a question, please do so via the Q&A button at, or the chat button at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you would, we are also broadcasting live via YouTube, so you can enter your questions there as well. The Q&A portion of the program will be after the lecture. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's speaker. Lindsay S. Cook is assistant, assistant teaching professor of art history in the School of Art at Ball State University. Originally from Chicago, she earned her BA in art history and French and Francophone studies from Vassar College and her PhD from the Department of Art History and Archaeology at Columbia University. She is an architectural historian, medievalist, digital humanist, translator, and digital preservation advocate. She is the translator of Notre Dame Cathedral, Nine Centuries of History, Penn State University Press 2020, a content editor of the open access databases, Mapping Gothic France and Musiconus, co-editor of the Notre Dame Translation Project, and chair of the Digital Resources Committee of the International Center of Medieval Art. I now turn the Notre Dame of Paris and the Light of Fire program over to Dr. Lindsay Cook. Thank you, Dr. Cook, for being with us tonight. Thanks so much, Tracy. I'm going to go ahead now and share my screen. And for those of you in the Zoom room, please um, holler if anything isn't um, working at any point and we'll try to sort it out. So thanks everyone so much for being here. And I want to thank uh, again, Dr. Alan Klein for his generous support and Catherine, Tracy, Heather and their colleagues at the Flint Institute of Arts for extending the invitation and organizing tonight's event. I'm very pleased to be here and I only wish that I could be in Flint um, with all of you together in person tonight. I look forward also to answering your questions after my talk. And in fact, if you have questions as we go along, feel free to enter them in the Q&A or in the chat feature in YouTube. Um, and at the end, we'll, we'll get to them. If you, as you think of them, you're, you're welcome to share them in the Q&A. Tonight, I'll speak, as you can tell, about the past, present, and likely future of Notre Dame, the Cathedral of Paris, in the light of the 2019 fire. On the evening of April 15th, 2019, a catastrophic fire broke out at Notre Dame of Paris in the wooden framework of the great steeple above the crossing. So the crossing, if you're not familiar, that's the part of the building where the central vessel intersects with the transept. Or in other words, if you think about the building in plan, the way that it would appear on the ground, it looks like a cross, right? And so the crossing is the place where uh, one arm of the cross intersects with the other. The fire ripped through the elaborate oak, oak frameworks of the 19th century spire, which you're seeing here, and the 13th century roof, burning so hot that the flames appeared to take on a life of their own, according to eyewitness testimony of the firefighters who rushed to the scene and were first to respond. 
the blaze gradually consumed the roof trusses. So those were medieval roof trusses with, made of wood of the 12th and 13th centuries and put together in the 13th century. And ultimately, the fire caused these roof trusses to fall like dominoes. And we're seeing here a point before that happened, when the fire was burning so hot that it was starting to melt the lead of the roof covering. And um, you can begin to see the wooden framework of the roof underneath through um, the um, spaces that emerge as the lead roof melted. The fire likewise melted the spire's lead covering. And so you can see that sort of sheath of lead here and as well as its timber framework, which are again starting to see um, at the base, peeking through. This is not something you should see um, in, a, in a spire that's in good condition, obviously. Eventually leading the tip of the spire to separate from its base entirely, pulling away, and it fell westward, crashing through a stone vault in the nave below. So the nave is the part of the building when you first walk in, if you've ever been to Paris, you walk into the building, you're standing in the nave. Um, and so it's one of the vaults of the nave that um, the spire first penetrated. As it falls here, you can see this is the center of the building falling westward. While some sparks and molten lead before this point had already begun to enter the building through small apertures in the crossing vault, the central vault, until this very moment, this is really a decisive moment in this image here, the conflagration had been largely contained within the building's attic, so up above the stone vaults. And the flames had not yet, um, they didn't yet have free reign to lick the interior proper because the stone vaults still stood as a protective barrier. After the tip of the spire collapsed, so after this moment, the base of the spire followed shortly thereafter, what you can still see here intact at this point. And it um, did not fall westward, it fell southward, so in this direction, and ultimately destroyed the crossing vault, which is right below the base of the spire, as well as some of the adjacent, the neighboring vaults um, in the transept arms. The blaze burned so hot that the firefighters initially sent up the stone steps of the spiral staircases of the north and south transept arms, ultimately had to abandon their posts entirely, let the roof go, decide that it could be consumed entirely by fire, and they had to focus their efforts on putting out the fire that emerged in the wooden belfry of the north tower of the west front. So that's this one right here. This is the uh, North Tower. There's a wooden belfry inside of that stone tower. In an effort to preserve the Western frontispiece or what we might think of as the face or facade of the building. In this image, we see a more distant view of the cathedral than the previous images I've shown you so far in a photograph taken after the spire had fallen and the roof structure had collapsed and at this point is charred its remains, sort of littering the tops of the limestone vaults below. What we're left with then above the roof line are the three stone gables that once capped, these were the ends of the wooden roof. So you see one here to the north with the gable itself and surrounding pinnacles, one here to the south, and one here through the flames that are smoldering, still smoldering here. You can see the gable of the west end. After the fire was extinguished, this was more or less the state of the building. Above in this image, you'll, you'll see the snarled steel of the scaffolding. That scaffolding was in place for the major restoration project that had only just gotten underway before the fire. And in fact, seems to have been the place where the fire began. Next, you'll see, you'll notice the charred remains of the wooden roof. So they're littering the tops of the vaults. You see them here and in the foreground as well. The beams piled up, loading the tops of the thin stone vaults, which were made fragile by a combination of the extreme temperatures of the fire itself, as well as the water that flowed forth for many hours from the fire hoses. And in the center of this image, probably eer eeriest of all, you see the gaping void in the midst of the scaffolding. This is where the stone crossing vault and the spire previously stood. So the stone vault, the central uh, crossing vault would have been here, would have met these other vaults that you see, neighboring vaults. And then above it, that's where the spire was placed. 
So to review, the elements destroyed in the 2019 fire were the lead roof covering, the sophisticated 13th century wooden roof framework, the 19th century spire, which consisted of a wooden core and a lead sheath on top of it, the stone crossing vault, and some cells of the stone vaults of the nave and transept arms. And you'll recall that that largely happened, the, the collapse of the vaults, that happened when the spire fell, both westward and southward. With the cathedral still smoldering in the background, the night of the 15th, French President Emmanuel Macron delivered a short televised speech on the very night of the fire. We will rebuild this cathedral together, he assured listeners. And in a separate address the next day, he specified that the building would be rebuilt better than ever, he assured them, within five years, so that is by 2024. Appointed to oversee the project was General Jean-Louis Georgelin, who now presides over a task force known as the Établissement Public Chargé de la Conservation et de la Restauration de Notre-Dame de Paris. At the conclusion of a cabinet meeting convened two days after the fire, then Prime Minister Edouard Philippe unveiled the administration's controversial plan to hold an international architectural competition to determine whether the spire should be rebuilt at all, and if so, whether it should be a copy of the one designed by the 19th century restoration architect Ville the Duke, or if it should instead take the form of quote, a new spire that reflects the techniques and issues of our own day. And if you're interested in this, I'd be happy in the Q&A to discuss a bit more about what was at stake here in that possibility to um, rebuild the spire um, in a way that reflects issues of our own day. What, what might those be? We can talk about those later if you're interested. A law passed in the summer of 2019, so shortly in the months after the fire, stipulates that the 21st century conservation and restoration of Notre Dame must, quote, preserve the historical, artistic, and architectural interest of the monument. And for the past two years, architect-in-chief Philippe Villeneuve and his team have been doing exactly that. There's in fact a kind of trio of architects who are in charge of the project, and they've been um, uh, doing painstaking work for the last two years. They were on the scene the night of the fire. Um, Villeneuve actually wasn't in Paris and he had to spend the early hours of the fire actually in a train getting back to Paris in order to uh, assess the damage. And the efforts of the three architects and their teams to assess the damage and shore up the building to ensure its structural stability began shortly thereafter. And really as soon as it was safe to enter the building or possible to enter the building, maybe not even that safe, um, they, they did so. The architects installed a temporary roof very quickly um, after the fire to protect the exposed stone vaults from the elements. So the vaults were now exposed. That was a situation that had not, um, that's, that's not normal and it had not been that way for a very long time. Um, and so you see this temporary roof, it's almost tent-like in its form, uh, very provisional that was um, put up right away. And they also had wooden braces custom made to cradle the flying buttresses. So every single flying buttress is, has a slightly different um, form and has obviously you know, um, shifted over the years um, slightly and was already custom made in the first place. And so a cradle was produced for every single flying buttress that would fit it like a glove. I'm showing you here just a detail that, that shows one of these uh, braces being installed. And you can see that they had to be uh, carried in by crane. They're very heavy, largely made of wood. Um, and this is one of those ways, we'll see another example of this, where the shoring up of the building looks very much to my eyes as a medievalist, um, like we think it probably looked when the building was first being constructed in the first place. So there's a way that caring for the building, uh, maintaining it, shoring it up, stabilizing it, all of that looks very much like construction also, um, the way that construction would have looked initially. Well, the stained glass was not damaged and this was a real, um, uh, it was a bright spot in, in an otherwise really devastating event. And most of the glass even remains in place, even to this day. So for instance, the rose windows, um, the stained glass of the rose windows has never moved, it's still in place. 
but workers have tempor temporarily removed the glass from the upper windows. Um, so for here, the clear story windows, you'll notice that the tracery, the stone tracery obviously is still in place. That's integral to the structure of the building, um, but the glass itself has been removed. This was 19th century glass that you're seeing that's no longer here. And then the openings have simply been covered up uh, temporarily. And this will of course be, it's being cleaned and it will be returned to the building once it's um, back in shape. The architects subsequently designed a sturdier, still provisional, but sturdier wooden roof. And you can see that here. Um, so gone is that tent-like structure and instead we have a sturdier wooden roof in this case. This temporary wooden roof protects the vaults below just as the tent-like one did. Um, of both the nave and the choir. And it has also facilitated the removal of debris from the tops of the stone vaults, which, as I mentioned before, were made fragile, not only by the collapse of the spire, which that sort of brunt, um, uh, the, the brunt of the collapse of the spire, but also from the fire itself and the water that was used to fight the flames. highly skilled rope technicians use this, the wooden rafters to repel down from them um, and into the holes in the stone vaults below in order to ensure the stability of the vaults. So here, for example, at right, you can see these skilled workers removing a loose stone block to prevent it from falling down below. And I should add that there are net, there are uh, nets that were put up really quickly after the fire. And so technically, if a small stone fragment falls, it would fall into the nets, not onto the head of a worker down below. Um, but obviously it's better to collect these when they're still sort of a bit loose in the vault itself than letting it collapse and damaging the stone further. Because of course, this is a cleanup effort. Everything is treated as historical um, artifacts. And so you don't wanna damage anything that isn't already damaged uh, just from the fire itself. And a lot of work along these lines has already been completed. And the vaults are also being monitored continuously to avoid further collapse. Another thing that the workers are able to do, thanks to these wooden rafters that have been installed is to collect the loose debris, um, which as I mentioned, it's treated not as junk like you might think on a, on a site like this, but rather as historical vestiges that might have historical value, that could have archeological value. Um, they, they're, um, for scholars, it's extremely important to collect these things. Um, and they're carefully removed from the tops of the vaults. So in some cases that occurs by hand, and in other cases, and this is really remarkable to see, um, there's, there's some documentation of this. Um, in some cases, it happens with a kind of industrial vacuum. So um, where suction is used to collect the uh, soot, uh, lead dust, all of these other things, but also small debris, things like um, nails, which many of them are medieval nails that would have been used um, in the earlier construction. And so the idea is to collect these things um, with the hope that this tragic event can also lead to scholarly discoveries and that we can really learn more about the construction of Notre Dame, the medieval construction of Notre Dame and the 19th century um, restoration campaign than we've ever known before. That would be the silver lining of this tragedy. Two cranes were also installed on either side of the cathedral. So you can see both of them here. Stationed on the north flank, that is this side of the building, the smaller crane is used to lift pallets containing meticulously documented archaeological materials, which have been cataloged and um, uh, sorted out of the building before they're shuttled to tents, which you can barely make out over here, but they're here in the background, pitched on the plaza immediately west of the cathedral. And so there it's kind of a depot that's been established for the um, fragments of wood, fragments of stone that fell from the vaults. All of that is being collected, cataloged, and um, will be studied. Set up on the south flank, so over here on this side of the building, the larger crane facilitated the disassembly of the steel scaffolding that had been put up to restore the spire prior to its collapse. So this was scaffolding installed really pretty shortly before the fire. It's also on this construction site where the fire broke out. 
And then because the fire itself damaged the scaffolding, mangling it, it needed to be really carefully disassembled without further damaging the surrounding building, the stone skeleton around it. This was a delicate business, as you can imagine. So this en endeavor of taking down the scaffolding took many months. And here you see the steel scaffolding shortly after the fire. This was a, the summer after the fire. And you can see it's kind of collapsed in. There's also, as you know, a void, this empty space um, in the middle where the spire once stood. And that process took several months and finally concluded in November 2020. And this is a celebratory image, um, you could say, of the space where the crossing, this, the crossing here, uh, free, finally liberated of its um, scaffolding surrounding it. So this means that it's um, in a position that now they can get to the point where they're actually conserving and ultimately restoring the building now that the scaffolding is gone. The final phase of the Notre Dame stabilization involves the creation and installation of wooden centering for the stone vaults. So first, scaffolding was built beneath the vaults, and that is to say steel, steel scaffolding has been built on really, it's proliferating around the building. And um, on the top of the uh, scaffolding centering, which uh, is made of wood and metal, like the one, the example you're seeing here on your screen, it's inserted above the steel scaffolding and beneath each stone vault. So this is to support the stone vaults that didn't actually collapse, but um, are still in danger, that you know, they want to make sure that they're secure and that nothing else falls down as they conserve the building and ultimately restore it. Each centering, I should add, like the flying buttresses, I said this earlier about the flying buttresses, it's also true of the vaults. Each centering is unique. It's custom made through high tech means to fit a particular vault like a glove, stabilizing it for the conservation and restoration work that's yet to come. So the process of inserting centering beneath more than 60 vaults, it's a lot of vaults to, to get through, it's well underway and that process should take a few more months to complete. So by the end of the summer around there, we should start getting to the point where everything is stabilized, all of the vaults are stabilized, uh, and the building is shored up, um, essentially. There have been several occasions, as I alluded to earlier, over the past two years, when I've really marveled at the fact that the restoration architect's approaches, in this case, after this event, often mirror those of the medieval builders, and their use of wooden formwork to cradle the vaults is really a case in point. So I'm showing you here um, a hypothetical reconstruction of the iteration of Notre Dame as it existed around the year 1177. Now this seems like a very specific number. Um, and the reason that it's around 1177 is we have a text that um, comes to us from that date. And it suggests that at that point, the building or meaning the east end of the building where the building started, uh, the construction started, that the east end was pretty much complete except for the vaults. And what that suggests, we know from other buildings, um, comparable buildings, that usually the roof was built first. As you can expect, we know now with Notre Dame without a roof, it doesn't work very well, it doesn't protect the vaults. And so it made sense actually to build the roof first and then construct the vaults afterwards. So that's exactly what you see here, is a wooden roof covered with a lead, um, or wooden roof framework covered with a lead roof, and down below, you'll see wooden formwork. And what that's there for is to um, serve as the guide for the stone uh, blocks that will be uh, to, to create the ribs of the vaults and then to fill those in the webbing of the vaults as well. So this is a, another way where the construction and the uh, stabilization have really mirrored one another. As you will have noticed, all of the steps I've described so far have consisted of cleanup and structural stabilization efforts, not restoration work per se. Affording the various stakeholders time to express their views about how exactly the cathedral should be restored. After months of debate over the exact form the restored cathedral should take, the Macron administration ultimately approved Chief Architect Villeneuve's proposal to restore the 19th century spire identically. So to really replicate to the best of their abilities, 
um, the methods, techniques, materials of the 19th century spire, um, which was very well documented, I should say, not only by the original designers in the 19th century, but also subsequently by the rest by architects who are in charge of cathedrals like Notre Dame, um, there was already a lot of documentation of that spire. So we don't see it here, but the idea is um, to restore the spire identically. The decision in favor of an identical restoration begs the question, how does one replicate a lost original? This is where multiple types of meticulous documentation made before the fire come into play. The French National Center for Scientific Research, or CNRS, has made a concerted effort to pull together all of the laser scan and photogrammetric data in existence related to Notre Dame. So they really scoured the world looking for all of the data of this cathedral, traces of the building, whether digital or analog. And in order to complete the daunting task of replicating the roof and spire, the architects have this composite 3D model at their disposal, as well as their own elaborate, detailed, hand-drawn technical drawings. Um, and I should mention while we're looking at this image, one place where there is a really excellent hand-drawn survey is of the roof. So one of the affiliated architects, his name is Rémi Fromeau, he was um, responsible for creating this survey of, you know, drawing every uh, roof truss in the existing framework before the fire. And this was several years before the fire, obviously not knowing that that would happen. And it will become really a valuable record um, as the process of restoration unfolds. A key piece, a key component of the composite model I just showed you is the extensive laser survey of the cathedral from pavement to spire that the late architectural historian Andrew Tallon produced in 2010. Laser scanning is an efficient means of accurately measuring an entire edifice, the kind of thing that might have taken a lifetime for an architectural historian um, in the past where you would hand measure a building. Um, this can now be done over a few days with, uh, through high-tech means. The process began in the case of the 2010 laser scan by placing a series of reflective targets on the surface of the building. Then a state-of-the-art laser scanner was placed in dozens of spots in and around the cathedral to capture every inch and even really down to the you know, centimeter, millimeter even. At each station, the laser scanner emitted a laser beam and rapidly sort of sweeped, uh, it, it sweeps along the building, and it rapidly computed the distance between the scanner and the contours of the building. Using specialized computer software, these points were then plotted in a three-dimensional coordinate system, and the result is known as a point cloud. So you can say that we're looking at the point cloud um, of, of Notre Dame from 2010. The 3D model may then also be sliced into smaller pieces and examined more closely using analytical software. While this data from the Notre Dame laser survey has become a precious record of Notre Dame, digitally preserving the cathedral in its pre-fire state, along with the other um, pieces of uh, digital data that existed from other sources, Andrew Tallon's own reasons for employing this particular technology were decidedly different. The primary reason he wanted a laser scan of Notre Dame of Paris was to understand Gothic structure more completely and to pinpoint anomalies in the building's design. To cite just one example, the laser scan served as the basis for a new ground plan of the cathedral in what would be fair to call and what Andrew Tallon definitely liked to call the first accurate plan of the building. For generations, plans of Notre Dame were rectified sometimes to a small extent, sometimes to a greater extent, to appear more geometrically regular, more perfect than the building actually is. In reality, the cathedral's ground plan is far more idiosyncratic. And here we see two slices from the laser scan, which were superimposed in order to draft the new ground plan. This ground plan is the result color-coded to reflect architectural campaigns from around the year 1160, around when the building began, to around the year 1350, 
when the medieval edifice was essentially complete. The new plan and some of Andrew Tallon's other findings were published in the 2013 book he co-authored with Sorbonne architectural history professor and researcher Denis Sandron. And a new slightly revised French edition of this book was published mere days after the 2019 fire and ultimately dedicated to Andrew Tallon as he had passed away um, in the interim. And while living and teaching in Paris in the summer of 2019, I translated the 2019 edition of the, uh, of the original French language text into English. And um, as Tracy mentioned at the beginning, Penn State University Press has recently published my translation under the new title, Notre Dame Cathedral, Nine Centuries of History. This beautifully illustrated, reasonably priced paperback is now available for you to peruse at your leisure if you wish. Not only did the laser scan then effectively capture what was there when the scan was made in 2010, but it also served as the basis for a series of hypothetical reconstructions of historical states of the building. And we've actually already seen the one that you see on the screen now. The graphic designer, Laurent Stefano, rendered the hypothetical reconstructions, draping appropriate textures over the laser scan data. And as accurate as the measurements of the underlying 3D model are, these reconstructions do, of course, reflect not just what we can't be certain about any of this, right? Because it's not part of the building anymore. It's really peeling back historical layers. So therefore they reflect specific scholarly points of view. Crucially, they also show us change over time. And this is what's helpful about them, especially for students and the general public to get a sense for the way the building has changed over the years. It's not a static entity. It's certainly not a timeless monument, Notre Dame of Paris. So you're seeing here the sort of earliest um, phase of the building. It began in the East End. At this point still, we could think of it as an early Gothic monument. And then over time, it transforms and um, takes on a new skin, you could say, over the centuries and is updated even at a time when you can say the building is complete, that is around 1245. They get back to work. They tear down windows that already existed and put in a new tracery that's really up to date, the most technologically advanced tracery you could imagine. Um, and also beautiful, um, large rose windows in the transepts uh, arms as well. Um, so all of these updates give us the building as we know it today. And it's a building that really uh, transformed and became itself over time. As you may have noticed in the hypothetical reconstructions I just showed you, um, the late medieval Notre Dame did have a spire over the crossing, although the early Gothic Notre Dame did not. And this 17th century print gives you a sense of the scale and profile of that 13th century spire. However, during the French Revolution of 1789, the spire was damaged and it was later taken down and entirely removed resulting in the view you see in this 19th century engraving. Yet the base of the 13th century spire did survive under the roof, and you have some evidence for that right here. You can see a little element jutting out um, above the roof line, and that's a piece of that, um, the base of the spire, which is underneath the roof. Major changes were also made to the building in the 19th century particularly during the mid-century restoration by the architects Jean-Baptiste Lassus and Eugène viollet le duc And so here you can see essentially a before and after of their intervention. And um, the building changed in some cases in ways that we might think of as being relatively minor. Um, so in the 18th century, this door had been changed. It had been extended and broke through some of the medieval sculpture. And the restoration architects in the 19th century thought that wasn't a good idea. And so they restored this lintel, for example. So you see the door has gone from being a pointed arch back to having this straight lintel. In other cases, we had no spire circa 1840. And by the end of the restoration campaign, we have this uh, spire that's actually grander than any spire Notre Dame had ever had. The restoration architects studied the physical remains and graphic traces of the 13th century spire to design their own new spire, 
shown here in one of their 1843 competition drawings. And while the architects certainly used their imaginations, at this stage, their spire closely resembled the original, meaning the 13th century spire, the memory of which survived through graphic traces in the form of drawings and prints, like the print I showed you before. And so here you see it's a relatively modest spire and pretty similar to the profile of the spire that, um, as far as we know, existed um, from the 13th century onward. However, in 1857, after Lassus's death, so that was the, he was the sort of older, more experienced architect. Um, once he died, Ville le Duc, um, whose name is much more closely associated with this building, I would say, for, for most people, Ville le Duc drastically revised the spire design that they had initially conceived in the 1843 competition. And so here you see that much grander sort of two-story spire um, that he redesigns in starting in 1857. The architect used as his model, not the 13th century spire from Notre Dame itself, but rather the 16th century spire of Amiens Cathedral, which you see here at right. And yes, it's true, if you look closely, your eyes are not deceiving you. Uh, the Amiens spire really does lean to one side. So you'll see that it's, it sort of slightly juts this way to the east. In fact, as the art historian Lynn Courtney has pointed out, Ville le Duc was acutely aware of the possibility that this exact thing might happen again. And he made a concerted effort in his design to ensure that the Notre Dame of Paris spire would hold up in the event of a violent windstorm. So he foresaw the possibility of wind um, having an impact on the spire. Ville le Duc also drew inspiration from the remnants of the base of the 13th century spire at Notre Dame. Remember, I, I pointed that out in the um, print that I showed you. And Ville le Duc studied um, that those remains before he replaced them with the new spire. What he did was he essentially brought that interior apparatus, that whole structure, from the interior underneath the roof line to the outside. And it forms the layered base of the spire where statues of apostles and symbols of the four evangelists were then placed. And I'll show you a detail here so you understand what I mean. So this is all the structure that sort of resembled the um, base of the 13th century spire that Ville le Duc found. And here we see a detailed view of several of the statues at the base of the spire. These were designed by Ville le Duc and realized by the sculptor Geoffroy de Chaume. And in fact, with a wink, Ville le Duc depicted himself in the guise of the Apostle Thomas, patron saint of architects. And so you see here, there are many photographs of Ville le Duc, and so it, it's not hard to recognize him if you've seen images of him before. This is his face on the body of the Apostle Thomas. The well-known pseudo-gargoyles, or chimeras, as they're uh, they were known at the time um, on the site, were likewise added to the cathedral for the very first time during this 19th century building campaign. So I know that particularly through Victor Hugo's um, novel, where you have the idea of gargoyles, even if they didn't yet exist um, on the building, um, and certainly in modern retellings of Victor Hugo's story, whether on film or um, uh, in images, we often find the gargoyles associated with this cathedral, and yet they're not technically, strictly speaking, medieval. They're medievalizing um, and, and really um, interesting features, but also as the art historian Michael Camille has shown, they are definitely um, figments of the 19th century imagination. And we can talk more about that later if you're interested in it, um, but they certainly reveal elements of archeology, span science, pseudoscience, um, and uh, of their own, of, of Ville le Duc's own day and not the, not the Middle Ages, which is really, really something to think that these had become kind of totemic, totemically associated with the Middle Ages, even though they're 19th century. So these accretions of the 12th century, 13th century, 14th century, and so on, all the way down to the 19th century overhaul resulted in the version of the building you see here in a photograph I took from an apartment on the Ile Saint-Louis a few years ago. If I asked you to conjure up an image of Notre Dame of Paris in your mind's eye, isn't this more or less the iteration of the building you might summon? 
But even this version of the cathedral was in need of critical care. So at this point, when I took this photograph, plans were already underway for a major restoration campaign. And by 2019, a nonprofit had raised enough money for a major restoration project to get underway, beginning with the spire. In spring 2019, the restoration of the spire began in earnest, first with the construction of scaffolding around its base, so this famous scaffolding, we've now seen it several times. And then in early April 2019, you heard that right, really just a few days before the fire, with the temporary removal of the copper statues of the apostles and evangelists from the base of the spire. And this was quite a spectacle. There, there was a lot of media attention surrounding this. And I'm sure if you were in the area when this happened, where great cranes were removing the, the statues from the base of the spire, it would be quite a spectacle. Um, and little did we know that what the spectacle that was to follow. The statues were safely transported to a warehouse to undergo conservation treatment. So you see them here separated into the two parts. Most of them are, have um, the body, at least the apostles are uh, made of these two parts, a, a body and a head. And as each statue is restored one by one, they're returned to Paris and installed in a gallery surrounded by plaster casts, most many of them made in the 19th century. Um, of Gothic monumental sculpture in a marvelous museum in Paris's 16th arrondissement called the Cité de l'Architecture et du Patrimoine. And I highly recommend if you haven't been here, it's a, it's a kind of must-see um, destination. And now even more so because there's a gallery that consists of a lot of uh, sculptural fragments from Notre Dame that are kind of waiting, uh, waiting to be uh, placed on the building when they can be in a few years. As I mentioned earlier, the Prime Minister announced shortly after the fire that there would be an international architectural design competition to, deserve, to determine what to do about the lost spire. And numerous architects and historians, however, subsequently vocally opposed that initiative. They mostly dismissed it as a beleaguered president's vanity project. You'll remember this was kind of at the height of the Gilets Jaunes move movement in Paris. But I have to say that I personally saw this whole thing a bit differently, as I think this was intended as an internationalist gesture, something that would bring the world um, into this uh, and, and sort of give them a stake in this, in, in this project. In the midst of what might otherwise have become, certainly had been in the past in the 19th century, restoration um, and nationalism were very much intertwined. Um, and indeed, what has largely become a national project. And I'd say that's largely because of COVID too. The fact that we have um, closed borders has meant that in the past year, especially, this has become something that is a, is a French project ultimately. Separate from that official initiative, this idea to have an international design competition, an architecture publication, a period, uh, architecture publication, mostly online, but also they ultimately produced a book as well they launched an unofficial design competition. And so the winning entry in that competition is shown here at right. It was designed by the architects Tsai and Lee, who are two Cornell University trained women who work at the firm Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. So a project along these lines, I'm using this kind of as a thought experiment, um, but a project along these lines would have revealed rather than concealed the fact that the restored cathedral will be, whether we like it or not, a product of our own time. As it turns out, as I mentioned before, the 21st century restoration project will be far less radical. In July 2020, President Macron signed off on a plan to restore the spire identically, favoring a design more like the image at left than the one at right. And I'm very interested to hear your thoughts about this, if you, if you think this was a missed opportunity or exactly the right thing to do. So to that end, to the end of having an identical spire, in March 2021, the work of collecting oak trees of the appropriate age, shape, and dimensions for the new spire began under the direction of Philippe Gourmand, national coordinator for the donation of oak trees for Notre Dame of Paris, whom you see in the image at left. Around 1,200 oaks, tall in height, 
wide and consistent in diameter, and whose trunks are pin straight for at least 10 meters, I believe, that's the limitation, have been thoughtfully sourced from regions throughout France to have a second life, as many people who are donating the trees have described it as sort of having them be um, reborn in the new spire, in the restored spire. Forestry experts oversaw this procedure this past spring. It was mostly in the, the month of March before this, the sap ascends into the trees. And usually I, I have seen a lot of these maneuvers and usually what happens is the branches and the crown of the tree were removed before the tree was felled. And then the resulting timbers are now being dried for between 12 and 18 months. In 2023, around 1,000 timbers will be selected from among these 1,200 best ones, um, because of course all 1,200 that they took seem to be really solid and good on the outside, but you never know what you'll find inside. So that's why there's a bit of a disparity between the number of trees felled versus the number they think they will actually need. And around 1,000 timbers will then be used to construct the new spire. Then there's the roof. So the destroyed 13th century roof, charred remains of which you see on the tops of the nave and choir vaults in this aerial photograph taken shortly after the fire. So you see them here, all of these blackened bits of the roof. That roof was made of over 1000 freshly felled oak trees and freshly felled is a key point here. The roof was an integral part of the cathedral and an important example of medieval technology. The architects planned to restore the roof identically, just as with the spire. However, unlike the spire, whose oak timbers will be dried for several months before being put to use, the roof will be made of freshly felled oak, just as it was in the Middle Ages. And so it's for this reason that the oaks for the spire have been selected before the oaks of the roof. And so this means that um, in the future, probably at the same time of year, maybe next year, I would think, or the following year, um, there will be another campaign of collecting another thousand or so oak trees to um, use for, for the roof. Clearly, much work remains to be done. Um, and yet, with the proliferation of scaffolding that you can see here very clearly in a recent photograph, comes the promise that the next phases of the project, the conservation of the cathedral's fragile stone skeleton, restoration of its damaged limestone vaults, and the reconstruction of the spire and roof will soon begin. While the project will not be entirely finished by 2024, officials continue to predict that regular worship services will resume and the cathedral, complete with roof and spire, will reopen to the public by spring 2024. A hopeful message, I would say, at this point. In the interim, the cathedral remains closed to the public. And in fact, so too does the great plaza in front of the building, which had reopened, and that was a, a bright a sign of, of life, I think, but was forced to close yet again very recently after a routine test revealed an elevated concentration of lead on the site. Nevertheless, a sign printed on the temporary barrier installed around its perimeter reassures visitors that Notre Dame's rebirth, as they are wont to call it, we see here a renaissance and a rebirth, um, is underway. So thanks so much for your attention. At, at this point, I'd be delighted to take any questions you have through the Q&A feature in Zoom or on YouTube. Well, thank you, Lindsay. That was really, really good and, and so interesting. I know that um, people are probably just still taking it all in, but there are a couple of questions did mm -hmm. come in. So I'll go ahead and start with that. Um, this is from Catherine. She says, um, can you address the firefighting efforts to save the wooden belfry in the front left tower of Notre Dame? It seemed to be a suicide mission for the 20 or so firefighters. Obviously the fire was extinguished, but was it a wise mission to save given the, the potential loss of life? So um, this is chronicled really beautifully in a film that has recently come out that I recommend you um, 
look up and I think you can even maybe be able to find it online and I know there are screenings coming up um, by the No Day Brothers, N-A-U-D-E-T, and they chronicle sort of almost minute by minute but maybe hour by hour that very decision and to me that is the most um, moving moment in this whole firefight because what you find is for example they they speak to a, a rookie firefighter she's never had a real fire and she goes into the roof she actually climbs up one of these um, stone staircases and she finds herself in the roof and she's never fought a fire before like this certainly and she thinks it's really hot but she doesn't want to be the one to say oh this seems really hot i think we need to go back um and ultimately her you know the her partner, who's more experienced, said the very same thing. And they could even see that their helmets had started to change colors. I mean, it was really dangerous. And when we think about this, I mean, imagine firefighters in your neck of the woods, you know, here, the FDNY, um, the idea that they would be going into this building that had already been completely evacuated of people. This was never a mission to save people that were at risk. It was to save this symbol that for some reason, everyone seemed to appreciate was that valuable a symbol and was so important for Paris to save that they went up there anyway. And so ultimately what ends up happening is once they let that part go, they realize the need to focus on the North Tower and the Belfry there. The premise there was that it was not just a matter of like, they couldn't just let that go in the way they had with the roof, because in the case of the roof, there's nothing else sort of dangling from it, it, from it or anything. So once the roof collapses, it can fall onto the vaults. It might damage the vaults, but it's not going to do any other damage. Whereas in the belfry, what else does a belfry do? But it holds the bells. And so if that same thing had happened in the towers, all of those bells, tremendously heavy bells, um, cast bells would have fallen, become projectiles, and actually probably would have damaged much more gravely the Western frontispiece. So it was the decision they made. Um, there was some kind of question about it, but I think ultimately it, it comes down to those individual firefighters wanted to do it. They said, we think we can do it. They, they sort of scoped it out. They thought it was safe that they wouldn't um, end up losing their lives. But I think it's one of the most um, in, in, touching moments of the whole entire event is that someone decided that it was worth, that a building was worth this. Um, and I think everyone who was down on the ground who watched it happen agreed, concurred, mm -hmm. um, and all of the spectators really on all four sides of the building. Um, I, I'm sure, you know, there was a, a real sense of catharsis once that fire was put out and it was really just smoldering. They knew that the fire was kind of tamed at that point. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's hard to, to answer the question except to say they made the decision to do it. And it's, it's remarkable because it was not to save any human life. It was to save the Western frontispiece, um, right, it, which right. is, it's remarkable. Incredible. Um, and someone asked to kindly spell the name of who made the film when, one more. N-A-U-D-E-T. Okay. And you can see that. there's, I know that, at, um, for example, at the Alliance Française coming up in New York, there's an online event. You can even see it there and see a conversation with the, with the filmmakers as well. Oh, wonderful. So another question, um, this is from DJ. This is, uh, it's about the 19th century spire. Mm -hmm. What, what was the reaction to the construction of the spire at that time? And, and was, did people like it or did they see it as out of place? So I think the whole restoration campaign in the 19th century was seen as very expensive, <laughs> which it was. It was seen as, um, there's a joke that you actually read in um, a letter that is sent by somebody who is working in what we now think of as historic preservation. He sends a letter to the architects and basically says that he had visited um, the emperor, Napoleon III, and that Napoleon III basically said, you know, by the time they're finished with it, there's going to be nothing left of the whole thing. So basically they were giving it such a facelift <laughs> that it was going to be unrecognizable. And I have to say that that became the, um, I think that really goes for the spire as well as the rest of the building, that there were so many new stones being added to the cathedral that there was concern that what's old about this building anymore? Is it a new building? Is it an old building? And I have to say that that really persisted, that kind of myth of the cathedral being entirely 19th century has really persisted until I would say that the, the book that I translated really does a good job, I think, of resuscitating the fact that there are so many medieval stones that when the fire happened in 2019, there was a medieval building there to lose. It wasn't just a 19th century sort of symbol or simulacrum that was destroyed. 
Um, so there was controversy, as you can expect with anything, but it also factors into any other, any of the other kind of urbanism campaigns at the same time. I would say that if you were against houseminization in general, you would probably, you know, be against the overhaul of Notre Dame as well. Um, and there, there is a kind of reaction in the press at the time, but it's as today, there's controversy about it with, with, um, views in favor and against a couple questions have come in regarding the official cause of the fire. Does, has that been determined? They still haven't said, and it's uh, technically still under, you know, they're still assessing this. So it's still an investigation, ongoing investigation. I'm not sure that they're really going to ever be able to answer that question. Um, I do know something that I've noticed is that, um, I mean, I think that the restoration campaign the people in charge of the restoration campaign that was already underway, I do think that there was some concern, you know, did we self-doubt? Did we do something wrong? Was there something we did differently? And as far as we know, nothing was amiss. Um, so then you would expect that it's something more likely to have been something like an electrical fire. Um, but I, I can't answer that question because not even the French police have made a decision about that yet. So uh, Susan's asking, where is the stone coming from? We talked about the Wood. So some of the stones there at this point, the there's a whole working group at the CNRS um, that is analyzing the stone that fell from the vault. So in some cases, if, if the stone really just if, if it's because of the blunt force of the spire crashing through it, that the stones fell and wasn't that they kind of disintegrated, you might actually even be able to use some of the original stone that fell um, that night in the, the restoration. And you can imagine the sort of symbolic value of doing some of that, at least here and there. The decision about the quarries that are going to be used, that hasn't been made in the same way that, you know, the oak has already been sourced from all, of, all over the place. I think the idea is going to be certainly to stay in the region. There's a particular, um, you know, to, to stay in the Paris Basin is what it's called. Um, but who knows, I, I suppose that could also change depending, certainly the quarries that were used in the Middle Ages are closed. They're, they're no longer um, uh, available. So in that case, it won't be the exact same quarry going back to the quarry uh, to, to find the same stone. There's a, a few related questions about uh, works of art in, or artifacts yep. in the building. Um, one relates to what has anything been removed to put on display somewhere else? And then another one was, what was, was anything destroyed um, permanently? I would say the answer to the second question is pretty easy to answer as far as I can think of. I mean, no, um, which is remarkable, except for everything I talked about that was destroyed in, in the building. But in terms of works of art, relics, all of that kind of thing, there was a really, that was another kind of heroic effort that happened during the fire. And really at a time when it was definitely dangerous to be entering the building at a time when sparks are flying through, you know, even if it was before the spire fell and then even after the spire fell, to recover, you know, precious relics like the crown of thorns um, wow. and other elements like that. And then slowly but surely, they also got out every altarpiece, all of that. And I have to say also things like the, um, uh, the choir screen, for example, which is sculpted, that's all, I mean, it's certainly covered with dirt and soot now, um, but that can be cleaned. And it really seems like all of that conservation will be able to bring all of that back to life. Um, and then what was the first question? I had another. The, whether anything has been removed from to, the church. And put in other places. So yes. Um, so a lot of things are in storage at the Louvre. Um, and there are some bits and pieces. So I showed you the Cité de l'Architecture. You can see, for example, the rooster that was on top of the spire, um, the head of Ville le duc as the Apostle Thomas, that's in the Cité de l'Architecture. The restored um, apostle statues are there. There is also, if you've been to the cathedral and remember any of its sculpture, um, there was a virgin and child. Um, that's a very important 14th century virgin and child. That's been removed to the church called Saint-Germain-l'Auxerrois. That's right across from the Louvre Museum. And so you can go and visit it. It's in the same position in that church as it had been in the cathedral. So you'll find it if you go there. Um, so there is some attempt, I think, to put on display some bits and pieces to remind you that it's um, that these things have been pre preserved, they're safe, um, but a lot of things also are still in storage at this point. 
So I'm going to take some questions from YouTube mm -hmm. um, since I'm trying to balance here. We're getting lots. Um, this one is what effects are found on the limestone vault in terms of restoration or securing them? So this was interesting is that um, the one of the architects, so there's the chief architect, but he's also working with sort of two architects alongside him. And um, one of them has been really in charge. It seems like he's taking control of the vaults and another is taking control of the um, roof. And so what I've heard most recently is that basically um, the vaults are thinner than they were before the fire. Um, and so that tells you that really the heat and the water combined did actually have an effect on the vaults. And so that's why there's still some concern about their stability. So far, nothing has moved. I mean, there have been these points where um, the scaffolding, they worried that the scaffolding was, um, was moving. And even in those cases, when alarms went out off or whatever, they were able to see that, you know, it was just wind or there was nothing actually wrong structurally. Um, so that's good. But that's what all of these supports, the braces are supposed to do is to um, allow them to assess the vaults more, more closely. But if anything, I mean, it is true. They were already very thin vaults and they're now thinner than they were before. Wow. Um, John asks, are the freshly filled oaks so cut to exploit the deflection during drying to enhance the strength of the subsequent trusses? Can you say that again? I missed the beginning. Yeah, I was sorry. Are the freshly felled oaks so cut to exploit the deflection during drying to enhance the strength of the subsequent trusses? I don't exactly know how to answer that question. I do know that they're going to be um, quartered so that they'll actually be shaped. Um, and I, I wonder if that has something to do with that question, but I, I don't know enough about um, what they're planning to do um, at this point to answer that better. Uh, Randall asked to the extent that Notre Dame is a cathedral of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. a religious building. Um, and in, did they have any role in terms of the design or, or redesign of the spire? So the, the, it's very delicate, this relationship between the church and, you know, who owns the building versus um, the, the church um, being able to manage it and, and obviously have services there. And so this also all has to do with the French Revolution and following that where this shift takes place. Um, and even more recent laws that have made that distinction really clear. Um, but with that said, of course, the church, and even before this, in the previous restoration campaign, they had actually been largely responsible for raising money. Because on the other hand, the state doesn't rush to uh, donate funds for restoration. So usually the people who are the um, uh, custodians of the building are responsible for raising funds for restoration. And so this is where it, it's been a delicate balance. So I would say, if anything, they were, they continue to be as involved as they ever were um, in the the previous restoration campaign, they're certainly raising money um, and, and part of that effort. And I think they're also trying to um, emphasize the importance of things like the relics that have been recovered and the importance also of being back in the building to hold worship services, I would say. In terms of the design though, no, I mean, I think it's more about they want to get back into their building, of course, as soon as possible. They want it to be safe. They want it to be secure. Um, and I have a feeling also they don't mind the idea that it's going to look the way that it looked before. I doubt that they would have been brushing to have, you know, the, the most modern design of the spire. So um, lots and lots of other questions still. Um, but let's, talking about the spire, uh, one, a question came in on YouTube uh, from Amanda asking, what would you pick, the traditional or the global modern spire? So, I mean, it's, it's just, hard, it's hard to say because I think it was probably the right decision for this particular building and for a building that has become, um, it's had a 150 year long life in this form. And so as much as I might um, see that this gesture could have meant something and it could have said something about our own time period, I actually think that this is probably the smarter way to go, the much more conservative approach. That said, I would love to have seen what people <laughs> came up with. And I have to say too, that as a medievalist, I, this is going to sound strange, but as a medievalist, in the Middle Ages, when something like this happened, as happened all the time, Schaff Cathedral, the reason we have that building as it exists today is because of a major fire in 1194 that destroyed everything except for the Western frontispiece. And so what did they do? They designed a whole new building that now to us sort of defines an architectural style. So I think that um, if we had built 
<laughs> the way that they did in the Middle Ages or thought about um, these kinds of disasters in the way they did in the Middle Ages, we would have done the newest thing. Um, but I do think that there's, it makes sense to respect, to respect the form of the building that people did love and that had become a symbol. And I think that's okay. I also think that there, there's a mixture of things happening. So the reality of the way that they're going to restore, yes, there's to some extent, they're sort of um, not giving a nod to the traditional techniques and things like having, using freshly filled uh, wood instead of, um, instead of drying it out in the case of the roof, that's a case where good, you know, there's some sense of, of giving a nod to that, but also they're using things like 3D laser scans and um, that's helping them shore up the building. So I think that it's not such a, a, an old fashioned project ultimately, if you really get down to it. So when we talk, I don't think style is the only question to, to think about there. There's a few questions coming in about lead. So I'm gonna mm -hmm. try to group them together. Yep. One, the first part is, will lead be used again? And if not, what? And then um, you were you mentioned the dust, the lead contamination be, being the reason for the plaza uh, shut down. Um, and so they asked, are they going to use lead again? And then um, it is, is lead was, or is there any lead around the rose windows? And did any of that melt? So I think I, I got all of those questions. Got it. So I think the, um... Interestingly, they've already done some test cleanings of two chapels in the building. And so this is part of, they're really, because they're, they have the money and because they have, the building is empty right now and they can do it. They're taking this opportunity to also conserve and restore really every bit of the building. So that includes the wall paintings from the 19th century are now seeing the light of day again. And what they said in that case, and I would imagine that that applies to every, all of the interior surfaces, is that there was a layer of dirt that existed already before the fire that actually um, prevented the lead dust from infiltrating um, into, the, into the surface of the paints. And so what that means is that it was actually pretty easy to clean. It's in this cleaning process, especially with things like deep cleaning and power washing, it seems like that is actually what is causing these problems again with elevated lead, lead levels. So it's, it is as the building is being cleaned that it seems to be releasing more of, of the dust that was there. In terms of what they're going to do ultimately, I mean, I can think of other um, restoration projects Lead is a very common roofing material. And so I just haven't heard them definitively say yes to a lead roof because I guess it doesn't get people excited or there is so much controversy around it. Um, but at this point, I have no reason to think that they're not going to do that. So it, when I hear otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up. But um, at this point that I just, I think if we don't hear anything, it means they don't want us to think too hard about it. Um, but as far as I know, that's, that's the plan. Oh, a, a couple of questions about the cost. Is it, has it been fully fundraising? Are they still working on fundraising? Or? They're still fundraising. So if you're interested, go for it. There are um, a few, you know, sanctioned charities and including a 501c3 here in the United States where you can give your money. Um, and it's going to be enormously expensive um, is the, the reality. And particularly because they're trying to, um, it, it the structural problems really do sort of pose pose a challenge. And so I think that there was, there were already structural problems before. All of the flying buttresses were basically sort of, um, uh, there was spalling and things on the flying buttresses. So they, there was already a structural concern. And so now with the vaults weekend as well, I just think it's, it is a serious um, overhaul that, that is going to be needed. They do, they have raised a lot of money. I mean, so on the other side, you know, they have gotten um, a lot of money too. And, do they know the final cost yet or is it still? The... I think it's still, if they're still fundraising, I think they think that they need more than they have, but they already have a fabulous amount of money. So right. that tells right. me something. So um, Anne asked how and how did the architects prevent the oak that formed the spires from rotting? So what was originally in the tower or originally in the spire? In the spire. So this is from the, the 19th century. I mean, this is, as with everything, it has to do with humidity control. Um, and to be honest, because if you've ever been in these spaces, or even if you haven't, um, it is a different, it's almost its own kind of microclimate is the way that it feels. Um, and it's, so it's, it's like you would with any other kind of work of art is, is controlling the humidity um, in, was, under the roof. 
Was it accessible from inside of the building or um, when? It is. So, you, I mean, you, it, you do climb up through uh, spiral staircases inside the building, but um, it certainly wasn't on, you know, it was only specialists really had access to it. And it was, even if you went on a vertical tour, let's say where you were climbing up around the parapet ex on the exterior, you still likely wouldn't have usually had access to the roof. So it was, you know, that was, that was carefully controlled and, and only accessible mostly for maintenance, but also for, for scholars to visit. So again, I mean, this is the interesting thing is I think so many people, you might not even have known before the fire, even if you went to Notre Dame, you wouldn't necessarily know that there was this entire um, uh, system above the building that you weren't even seeing and that was under the, the lead roof that you um, see on the outside. So it was a kind of hidden gem of the building. And yet, you know, here we are. And it's, it's, it's part of what's causing all of this, uh, this trouble. It also, on the other hand, I mean, the fact that it's independent, the, the fact that the vaults, we, we do see, even though this was a case where this kind of all failed, especially because the spire collapsed into the vaults, the fact of the independence, the, the vaults um, separating off this space, it actually, that was an important sort of medieval technological development because previously when you had buildings that it was just, you know, a basilica with a wooden roof right there in the building, if this had happened in a building like that, the entire building would have, you know, it, it definitely would have done more damage to the, to the structural elements down below. So this still, even though this was a disaster, it could have been even worse, um, structurally speaking, if there were no vaults. Um, so that, that kind of independence of the vaults and the roof is a really important feature of Gothic architecture in general. And we have two questions, one from Grant on YouTube and Debbie and Zoom asking, are they doing anything to prevent this from happening in the future and kind of fire prevention or preventative measures? There are certainly will be, um, <laughs> they will be doing things differently. Yes. Um, the exact form that takes, I mean, to me, the, the worst thing that happened um, when the fire started had to do with really human error where it was misunderstanding, misinterpreting the signal. There was a really complex alarm system. And so it basically amounted to misreading and misunderstanding the parts of a gothic building and i have to say as a medievalist i thought this was the one time where all that terminology we force our students to learn it would have really saved someone in that day um and so understanding you know which roof and which part of the building was this mm. uh, and so basically they checked a place where there wasn't a fire there because that's not where the oh, alarm no. was sending them so i do right. wonder i mean to me they did it's not like they didn't have an alarm system um and there were reasons that you can imagine why they didn't have a sprinkler system in this space where right. you do want to avoid humidity, right? right. Um, so I do wonder now that it's going to be uh, materials, you know, culled in 2021, I do think it, it might be a different situation than it was when it was all historical materials. Because in that case, it was really treated as a space like you would treat a, a gallery in a museum, um, you know, so that that was a 13th century artifact that was being mm -hmm. preserved carefully. Um, and now it will be a very different situation. And obviously they don't want the same thing to happen again. Right. Uh, Stephen asked, how is the final co configuration or the, the, the spring 24 date uh, determined? <laughs> very quickly by the president of the country. <laughs> um, so I, I really do think it was a charge. It was a kind of mission that they were sent on to say, this is going to be it. Of course, there was a, the cynical response was, oh, that's the year of the Olympics. I frankly don't actually know that he thought of it in those terms, but um, it sounds good. He's actually, I was thinking recently, he's, he's the kind of person, he, it's not the first time that he said within five years, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. So it's a way of, of having a deadline. I think it sounds like there will be actually a lot of work left to do. So especially on the exterior, if you've ever visited any old building, I should say, definitely a medieval building, but any old building, you often will find yourself there and there's a lot of scaffolding on it. And I think the fact is that that will be the case at Notre Dame for some time to come. Another question uh, from Michael, is there any silver lining, sorry, I just lost it, silver lining to this tragedy, such as possible structural upgrades, historical finds, et cetera? Et cetera? I think the First of all, the kind of solidarity that has emerged among the um, scholarly community has been something that I've really never seen before. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm still early in my career, so who knows, maybe there's some earlier time when this happened. But the fact that people who 
work on um, adjacent fields have really sort of come to the center and come together and organizations have been founded to learn as much as we possibly can about the building. Um, I see that as the silver lining. I think the fact is, I was, I was mentioning as they're sort of hoovering up the debris, they're finding uh, bits and pieces. So for instance, the medieval nails that they're uncovering, um, you know, if you can start to quantify some of these things, I think it makes it uh, more concrete, less abstract, and we can definitely learn more about medieval construction and 19th century construction for that matter. Um, so I think that those scholarly findings are, are the, will be the best thing to come out of out of this. Um, in terms of structure, I don't necessarily see that um, we have learned a lot about structure from other buildings for, for various reasons. I, I don't necessarily think that that's going to be the first um, bit that we get out of this. Although I did, it was interesting. It was not fun or anything, but it was interesting to me to see the fact that the nave vaults, for example, could withstand, even though you know a few cells of the vault did, were destroyed by this you know, trauma of the tip of the spire falling through it, the fact that the rest of the vaults, you know, withheld all of this, uh, uh, the fire and the water and everything else, I thought that that was really remarkable. And it was kind of putting to the test the structural system. Um, so that to me, I think the night of the fire, we did learn something there uh, for sure. And uh, Jim asked, what skilled craft do you anticipate will be most difficult to recreate as the reconstruction proceeds? Are some of these skills lost to history? There is a um, sort of healthy tradition of, um, of this in France. And even there's a, a project that's been ongoing for many years now to use medieval methods to construct a chateau to a, sort of a castle, a medieval-like castle. And I know at the time when this was first happening, um, you know, people thought of this as being very anachronistic or silly or something. Um, and I really think that this has shown the importance of maintaining some of those traditions um, for those who are interested. It's, it's really essential. And the beauty is they're also able to train new people. Um, and that's what I've seen not only in France, but also here in the, in the States, is that this has renewed a kind of interest in, in craft, um, craft techniques that, that are not lost entirely, but um, need to be um, uh, disseminated still to, to future generations. I also think that they may or may not be so specific and particular about this. So I was thinking in felling the trees, for example, um, were there some axes that you could have imagined seeing in the Middle Ages? Sure. Were there a lot of chainsaws? Yes. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not exactly sure that, they're, that I'm, I'm convinced that it will be down to the last detail to the specifications of the Middle Ages for the, for the roof, for example. Um, but we'll see. Maybe it will be a mixture of the two. Mm -hmm. um, Dale asks, what were the proposed spire and roof made of in the magazine's unofficial competition winning design? So the one that I showed, I, I mean, I'm assuming metal and glass, but um, there was a variety and you can check it out if you're interested. Some of them, I have to say that, that with some of them, I was thinking <laughs> just architectural education has changed a lot um, over the, um, in recent years. And I was thinking that it's sort of too bad, or maybe I hope that this um, reignites some interest in knowing more about what the building already was. There were a lot of very, um, not particularly sensitive projects that I saw. And I think that's the most important thing. This would have been kind of, um, this kind of update, you would need to be really sensitive and appreciate what was already there in order to do something that didn't look just totally awful and, and wild. And so that's something that I, I, I do hope might come out of this is more interest in architecture schools of historical design. <laughs> Elaine asks, why are some oaks used in one area to be aged and others that need to be freshly cut? That has to do with the fact that the spire was 19th century, so they used different techniques and the roof was 13th century. So they're trying to adhere as much as possible, as much as we know from other existing uh, medieval roofs um, to, to stick with those uh, specifications. And luckily there are people who, um, scholars who have studied this extensively and are really the go-to people when it comes to all of this. <clears throat> Um, so I'm getting to the end of the questions here. Um, Joseph asks, in one of the pictures, it looks like a temporary structure next to the cathedral. Was it built to facilitate the restoration project or something else? 
So yes, if you're talking about in front of the cathedral, um, then that's definitely, there are several um, uh, tents and depots and all of that kind of thing. And um, also the place where the architects themselves actually have their offices now. And all of those are kind of temporary structures that have pop-up structures, I suppose, that have been put up since the fire. So yes, anything that you saw that wasn't really a stone building, um, yes, that's been added since, since the fire. And I think you've touched on this, but I, I'm, I'm, I'll ask it just to be sure. Uh, Jean asks, uh, will more modern structural materials be used to shore up or, you know, the wood or stone to make it stronger? Anyway. As far as I know, that's not the plan. So I think if they have to uh, substitute, let's say if they decide that one of the vaults is really in bad shape, they might have to, what looks like an intact vault, they might actually have to dismantle it slightly and replace some of the stones. But I think the, the premise is going to be to try to preserve as much as they can um, and use to the extent possible um, materials as close to the original as possible. And um, Dick wants to know, when did the use of spires become popular in churches? What was the driving motivation for adding them? So this is, um, it's around the time when we, when we find one at Notre Dame. So the, the 13th century is when you have spires of this kind. Um, and there are also, this is different. There are also stone spires. So that's a whole different, um, uh, whole different uh, typology. And if you're interested in this, there's a book you should read by um, Robert Bork. And it's basically thinking of spires as uh, skyscrapers. The subtitle mm. is skyscrapers of the, of the new Jerusalem. Um, and I think that's absolutely it. It's the sort of the, the visibility of them from afar, um, the way that they could be uh, fashioned to hold relics at the top of them, for example, um, and serving as lightning rods in some case is another um, use of them. But I think very much in the same way, why do we um, build tall in this country? I, I think that there's really something um, similar uh, parallel uh, interests sort of anthropologically, we could think of it as being a parallel desire in that case too. And this, these last two questions are sort of related about the stone and drying out after being saturated mm -hmm. by firefighting water. Um, have we learned anything about the, the, the masonry techniques or are we ever going to get it, is it ever going to be back the way it was originally? So the um, something that they're, they are doing now is sort of piecing back together. Now, this, now that the stones have been collected and cleaned and everything, they're actually able to see, you know, can we reconstruct the arch here? Um, you know, this, this particular um, rib of the crossing vault, let's say. And so they're starting to do that. And I think they are, to be able to take the building apart this way, you never, if, you, if you've studied construction of Notre Dame as you know, um, scholars like Caroline Berzelius has, has done this at Duke, um, you can only do so much. You can't actually take the building apart. So this is one of those ways where I do feel like having pieces of the vault, of the vault um, um, accessible is helpful. That said, some of them are newer than others, and, and that's part of the, the complication too, is trying to date things and understanding, uh, studying them chemically also so that you really understand what you're dealing with. So we'll take one last question from Janice, um, who writes, I heard there were beehive boxes by the South Tower. Is that true? Did they survive? I think that is true. Yes. And I think that they did. I, I feel like I saw this very same thing. There are various places in Paris that sort of historical places. I know in the Luxembourg gardens, they also keep bees there. I, I think that's absolutely true. Um, and as far as I know, they, um, they made it through as well, because I saw a kind of positive story about this, this too. Um, so yes, I think that is true. Well, thank you so much. Um, you there's so much information here and I want to remind everyone this has been recorded. It's going to be available on our website shortly at flynnarts.org slash lectures. Um, I, I recommend everybody go out and buy your book and uh, learn more and look, pour over all of these um, wonderful images and, and remind us just how magnificent uh, the structure is. So thank you so much for your time and for everyone's questions. Um, Thank you, Dr. Cook. Thanks so much for having me, Tracy. It was wonderful. Well, have a great evening, everyone.